and that you are dead to sin and that if, you know, the worst thing happens, you're going to go to be with Jesus. If you thought like that, nothing would bother you. The apostle Paul in Philippians chapter one, he says that, you know, he was on the verge of being put to death. He was in prison. He was going to go before Nero and uh, Nero and Nero might put him to death. And he says, but you know, I long to go and be with Christ. I'm in a, I'm having a problem deciding. Should I stay here or should I die and go to be with the Lord, which is far better for me to live as Christ and to die is even better. You know why he felt that way? Because he was thinking scripturally. He was thinking correctly. He said in second Corinthians chapter four, that we see things that can't be seen. We aren't looking at the physical things. We're looking at the spiritual things that can't be seen. And because of that, he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, we walk by faith and not by sight. And if this earthly tabernacle is dissolved, we would have a new one. If you would think that way, then when the doctor tells you you're going to die, it'd be all you can do to keep from reaching up and just kissing the doctor. (laughs) Saying, awesome, awesome. But instead we start crying and we get depressed and we feel justified in being depressed because the doctor told me I'm going to die. Well, you're going to go be with Jesus or you're going to get healed and use it as a great testimony for the Lord. There's no re- there's no excuse for being depressed because your doctor says you're dying. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> I know y'all are thinking, man, how can you think this way? This is the reason I hadn't been depressed in 44 years. It's because you know what? I've been standing in the word and I had a lot of depressing things happen. And yet I fight them and I stand on what the word says and I focus on the good and even the bad things that happen. I think about, man, this could have been a lot worse if it hadn't have been for Jesus. You know, we just had these fires in Colorado and 350 homes were destroyed. And some people think about, look how tragic and look, and they just look at the people that have lost their home and they look at the suffering and they, and they focus on this and it's depressing. And I admit that that stuff is there. I'm not got my head in the sand and I don't say that we didn't have any problems, but I'm telling you, I had a friend of mine sitting at his house that was up on a bluff and he saw these fires coming over the mountain with 60 mile an hour winds and the flames were going half a mile being blown half a mile embers were were traveling over half of a mile and and the entire city of Colorado Springs could have been wiped out I could spend a long time saying this, but I'm saying that the guy who is running the fire service says he's never seen conditions like this. It was so dry that when a tree caught on fire, it would explode and throw embers as wide as this room. You here in the Midwest, you don't understand how dry it is in Colorado. 5% humidity the day and the highest heat on record and then 60 mile an hour winds and trees were exploding and throwing embers a quarter of a mile. And they, they, it was nothing but a miracle of God that kept Colorado Springs from burning to the ground. And this friend of mine was up on the bluff and he and his church began to start praying and those winds came back on themselves and literally put that fire out. And... Even though there was 350 homes lost, there could have easily been 3,000 homes lost. There was two people that died. There could have been hundreds that died. And you know what? You can either focus on the tragedy that was there, and there is tragedy, or you can say it was, could have been much worse. Man, God intervened. God moved. God stopped this. And it just depends on which side you look at. You can actually look at a negative situation and say, praise God for the redemption. World War II was a terrible thing. A lot of people died. You can focus on all of that or you can focus on all of the people that rallied and the world came together and they overcame that evil. And it was one of the great triumphs to be able to overcome that because Hitler and the Japanese were about to overrun the entire world and God turned it around. And you can either look at that or you can, you can look at the good or you can look at the bad. The six day war in Israel, I talked to, or I heard a general interviewed and he talked about how that these, they were overwhelmed by all of the Arab nations around. And yet they said that they would see entire squadrons of planes flying and coming at them and they'd fly into a cloud and never come out. 
There was miracles. He just talked about miracle after miracle after miracle that happened. You can either talk about how terrible the war was and how people lost their life, or you can look at it and say, man, God intervened and looked how awesome it was. I'm telling you, you can look at your situations and gripe and complain about it. And we live in a fallen world and there's always going to be something wrong. If you don't have a problem now, hold on, you will. (laughs) And you can either focus on that and think about that and it will cause you to be depressed or you can focus on the positive. Your emotions are just an indication. It's, It's the plant that's growing up from what you've been thinking on. If you're depressed, you've been thinking on depressing things. Somebody says, but I've got depressing things. So do I. If I was to tell you some of the things that I deal with and some of the problems that I have, I could make most of you think, man, I didn't, I don't have any problems compared to you. I got some bad problems, but you know what? I don't focus on them. It's not what I'm aware of them. I don't have my head in the sand, but you let not sin reign in your body because you are the righteousness of God. God's power lives on the inside of you and you have the ability to choose. You are not an evolved animal. You are a person created in the image of God and you're born again and you got a new nature and you can control things in your life. You can, you can't control other people, but you can control your responses to them. Some of you have had terrible things happen, but it's your choice whether you become bitter or better. It's your choice. Amen. Amen. In verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Again, it's up to you who you yield to. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil never made anybody do anything. This is the reason the Bible says you have to stand against the wiles of the devil. That means the cunningness, the craftiness, the lies, the deception. Satan can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. You quit cooperating with the devil and he will not be able to force you to do anything. Man, that's awesome. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Man, I could preach on that for a few days. Did you know that the law is what strengthens sin? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. The law strengthens sin. If you are struggling under sin, under failure, under problems, you are a person that does not understand the New Testament grace and righteousness, and that's why it's not raining. Man, that's a mouthful. I could preach on that. But in verse 15, it says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And he comes back with the same answer. God forbid. No, that's not what he's saying. You, and then he gives the second reason in this chapter, why you live holy in verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, then you are yielding to the author of that. The one who gave you the temptation, which is Satan. And you are going to have Satan come in and destroy you. John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God is out to do good in your life. You submit to him and good will come upon you. You submit to the devil and he'll eat your lunch and pop the bag. (laughs) You do not want to do that. This is just simple. Sure, because of grace, I could go do a lot of things. You know, this is hard for people to understand because, again, the church as a whole believes that God uses people based on how good they are. That's what the, it's kind of unwritten, but that's what people believe. They believe that if you are being used by God, it's because you are so holy. And I I can guarantee you that's not true. You can ask my wife and she can tell you that that is not true. (laughs) But people think it's because you're so holy. 
And, you know, we hear these stories about people that operated in miracles and saw blind eyes open, deaf ears open, and they had miracle ministries and God was using them. And then you find out that they were a homosexual in the background, or you find out that they've been committing adultery or that they've stolen money. And people will typically say, I thought that was God. I thought God was using them. He was. Well, you can't tell me that God would use a person who committed adultery. If God waited until he had somebody who was qualified to work for him, he'd never use any of us. God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. You know what, God, I could go, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but I could go commit adultery. And did you know that the gifts and the callings of God would still flow through me? And some of you can't believe that, but it's absolutely true. Romans eleven twenty nine: 29, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God does not take them away. Some of you may not believe this or understand it, but it's, I'm operating in an anointing of God when I stand up and do what I'm doing. Before the Lord touched me, I was an introvert and couldn't look at a person in the face. And now I talk to thousands and millions of people. And it is an anointing. I remember one time that I actually had been out jogging. I was used to jogging six miles a day and I went to Mobile, Alabama and I didn't understand the difference that it made when it was hot and humid. And I went jogging and I tried to do the same pace that I had done and I had been on a fast for three days And I just did something to myself and I got up to preach and I was so weak and I, my eyesight, I couldn't see past the first pro. There was a thousand people in the auditorium and I couldn't see them. And I was so weak and my head was spinning that I actually got behind the pulpit just like this and stood here and held on to it because that's the only way I could stand up. And I preached like a house on fire and it just flowed out of me. I went long and the pastor actually had to come up and tell me to shut up and sit down. And I got the CD or it was a tape back then. And I listened to, and I was amazed. The word was just flowing out of me. I don't remember saying any of it. (laughs) Some of you may think, well, that's not God flowing through you. Well... You just don't know where I came from. Amen. But anyway, my point is that, you know, it's an anointing that God has placed on my life and I could go out and live in sin. And did you know what? It would still function. So because that's true, can I just go live in sin? I could do it and God would love me, but I'm stupid. How many times that make? I heard that Chris put the number 200 up on the screen. I heard about that. But I'm just stupid if I go do it because even though God still loves me and even though the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance and they would still flow, you know what? People would find out about it. They would lose respect for me, rightfully so. If I can't control my own self, well, then I don't have any business teaching you. And it would affect my ministry. It would condemn me. It would destroy my marriage. It would just do all kinds of things. It's just crazy to do that kind of thing. But see, most people don't understand. They think that God only uses you if you're holy. God hadn't got any other other vessels to use but unholy vessels. We're all in varying degrees of having problems. I don't have the problems that some other people have. I've never gone out and used profanity and I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never tasted coffee. It's true. 63 years old, never tasted coffee, but you got a scripture to stand on for coffee. Mark 16, 18 says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. And I'm saying I've not done some of the things that you all have done, but I guarantee you, I still, I still have things that God's dealing with me. God doesn't use me because I deserve it. What'd you do? God doesn't use me because I'm worthy of it. He uses me in spite of who I am, not because of who I am. But to the degree that I can, I seek God and I don't give Satan an inroad into my life because he will come in and cause me misery and pain. And I won't enjoy the blessings of God. Not because God shuts them off, Satan shuts them off. You're just crazy if you go live in sin. It's crazy. Don't do it. But it's not because God rejects you. 
It's because Satan is going to take an inroad. So this verse makes it very clear that to whom you yield yourself, his servants you become, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So therefore, quit living in sin. Man, that's awesome. I talked to a young woman this morning who just had all kinds of things wrong. And man, I mean, she got delivered. She got delivered big time of some demonic stuff and set free. And it was awesome. But she was born again when she was a little girl and she just walked away from it. And I said, you know what? This is the results of serving the devil. This is the kind of stuff that comes. And she understood it and she accepted it and she got set free today. Praise God. It's awesome. But that's like hitting your hand with a hammer and saying, God will still love me if I do it. Sure he will. But do you want that pain? (laughs) Do you want your hand to swell up? Do you want to lose a finger because you sat there and did something? It's just crazy. Why in the world would anybody do that? Don't do it. So these are two reasons. Let me add another reason why you don't live in sin. Because you know what? People are watching you. And if you're sitting here talking about, oh man, God's good and God set me free. And yet you're bound by sexual addiction, pornography, alcohol. You make a sorry witness and people are going to judge you and say, well, man, it didn't work very good for you. Why should I accept your testimony? You know, if a person comes in to teach you on finances and they're living on the street and they're a bum and they have nothing, most of you aren't going to take their advice because you say, I can see how that's working for you. Likewise, a minister who says, oh, God is good. God has set me free. And yet you are bound and you have all of these problems. You shouldn't be listening to people like that. If it wasn't work for them, it's probably not going to work for you. So you, you also live a holy life as a testimony to other people. There's other scriptures that say that. Let me jump down here and, well, let me just read these verses quickly in the name of Jesus. And we're going to get down to some other verses. Verse 17 says, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Notice in verse 17, it says you were a servant of sin, but now you are the servant of righteousness. Verse 18, being made free from sin, you are become the servants of righteousness. Now let me just break this down for a moment. When it says you are free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. What does this mean that you are free from sin? If you've listened to what I've said, this is talking about you're free from that sin nature. That sin nature is dead. This is not saying that you can't commit sin. You can still do wrong things because you haven't renewed your mind and you're going to continue to function as you were programmed. So this is not saying that you are free from ever doing anything wrong. It's talking about you're free from this old man. But here's a point that you became free from sin and you became servants to righteousness. Now look at this in verse 19. I speak after the manner of man because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What does that mean? When you were a servant to sin, when you were under this sin nature, when you still had a sin nature living on the inside of you, you were free from righteousness. Now, again, this righteousness is talking about your right standing with God. You had no right standing with God before you were born again. This is hard for some people to accept because, again, our society has put all of the emphasis on your actions. And most people, most non-Christians and even a large segment of Christians believe that if you act good and if your good outweighs your bad, then you're righteous. You're a good person. That is not true. You could do 99 things right. And if you do one thing wrong, you are unrighteous and you are condemned. 
Righteousness is not based on your performance. So people get confused here because they say you were free from righteousness. And they say, well, no, I wasn't as righteous as I am now that I'm walking with the Lord, but I was a little bit righteous. I was, no, you're either righteous or unrighteous. It's not a combination of the two. When this says you were free from righteousness, what it means is that all of your right actions, all of your good actions couldn't change that sinful nature regardless of how much you did. You could be the best lost person that the world has ever seen. You could be into all of the social programs. You could help people. You could help old ladies across the streets. You could do anything. You could just be nice and do all of these things. And if you aren't born again, you still have a sinful nature. You are not in right standing with God. If you die, you go directly to hell. I don't care how good you live. A lot of people, many, many people, Probably the vast majority of non-saved people would hate me for saying something like that. And even a lot of Christians would disagree. But that's what this is saying. Before you're born again, when you were a servant of sin, you were free from righteousness. You did not have right standing with God. I don't care how good you acted. Your good works couldn't change your sinful nature. Isaiah said it this way. Can the leper change his spots? No. No. Likewise, a lost man cannot get saved by his own goodness. Even if he acts better than I did, he still is free, separate from righteousness. That righteous, his good actions don't change his sinful nature. That's what this is saying. Let's read on verse 21. What fruit had we then in those things whereof we are now ashamed? The answer to that is a lot, a lot of fruit. For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, we have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. What does that mean? Well, go back to verse 20. If in verse 20, servants to sin was talking about before you're born again. Then in verse 22, it says become servants to God is talking about after you're born again. And if in verse 20, you were free from righteousness. That didn't mean that you couldn't do anything right and anything that might be accepted in the sight of God, but that righteousness or that good works didn't change your sinful nature. You had to be born again. If that's what verse 20 means, then in verse 22, the opposite is true, that now that you are born again and you are a servant to God, your sinful acts can't change your righteous nature any more than your good acts could change your sinful nature. Man, that is awesome. Most people understand, most Christians understand that your goodness can't change your sinful nature. But then they think that now that they're born again, your sinful acts can change your righteous nature and you lose right standing with God every time you sin. This is saying that you are free from sin. That doesn't mean that you are incapable of doing something wrong, but you are free from that dead spirit. You are separated from it. God is not imputing sin unto you and you retain your righteous position in the Lord even when you mess up. So since that's true, can we just go mess up? Well, if you're stupid enough to do that and let the devil have a free shot at you and come in and just ruin your life and take your joy and peace and your witness away, yeah, you can go live in sin. But if you're truly born again, your nature's changed. You don't want to do that. It says in 1 John chapter 3, Verse one, it says, behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Then verse two says, beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And then in verse three, it says, every man, not some or a majority, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. If you are truly born again, your nature is changed. You are dead to sin and you long to live for God. Every man that has this hope in him wants to live for God. If a person is listening to me today and saying, man, this is great news. 
God loves me and I can just go live in sin because that sin won't change my righteous nature. You were never born again. You've just gone through the motions. If you were truly born again, you want to purify yourself. You may be doing a poor job of it because the law actually strengthens sin. The law encourages sin. When you preach to people, don't do this, it makes them lust for the very thing you told them that they couldn't do. So if you're under religion, you may be doing a poor job of living a holy life. But if you are truly born again, you're miserable because of it. You want to live differently. And so any person who would take what I'm saying and say, man, this is just great. I can go live in sin. You ought to get born again. You need to receive Jesus as your Lord. If you're truly born again, you want to live for God and you can mess up. You can make big time mistakes. But you know what? If you're truly born again, you know better and you want to do better. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. And the last verse of Romans chapter six, verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Sin has wages. God's not going to pay them unless you don't accept Jesus. If you don't accept Jesus as your savior, then he will call your account due and you will pay for your sins. But if you've been born again, God's not going to collect on your sin, but Satan will. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is not good. There are consequences to your actions. And a person who would take grace and say, man, this is wonderful. And because of this, I'm just going to go live in sin because God still loves me. You'll pay for it. You will suffer but it's not God causing you to suffer. And he'll be right there when you're ready to quit doing it your own way. And when your ship begins to sink and everything's going wrong, the Lord will never leave you. He'll be right there and he'll love you. But you'll, you'll allow the devil to do things in your life that you don't want. I tell you, submitting yourself unto God is the right thing to do. Resisting the devil is the right thing to do. And you don't ever need to confuse those two. But isn't this awesome to think that you're a changed person and that you are now the head and not the tail and that you don't have to just live like a mere human being who's forgiven and you're waiting until heaven until things improve. One third of your salvation is complete right now. You have God living on the inside of you and to the degree that you get your mind in agreement with your spirit, you can experience victory and power right now in this life. You can reign in life through righteousness unto eternal life, unto an abundance in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you've got to understand your righteous position in the Lord. And that's awesome. I just pray that God helps you to understand what we've talked about today. This will make a huge, huge difference in your life. You know, if you aren't born again, if you have never had your nature changed, you need to receive this gift of righteousness and salvation today. It's all based on what Jesus did for you, not what you've done for him. So if you feel that you're the sorriest person that's ever lived, you can still receive it because God commended his love towards sinners. So you need to be born again. And if you are born again, if your nature has been changed, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to release this. And the Holy Spirit will teach you these truths. He will give you revelation. You need this. And many people think they have the Holy Spirit. And to a degree, that's true. The Holy Spirit is involved in your life. No man can come unto the Father except the Holy Spirit draw him. But there was a separate experience that Jesus told his disciples after they were born again. He said, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the power from on high, until you be endued with power from the Holy Spirit. And that happened on the day of Pentecost and they spoke in tongues. Speaking in tongues is one of the evidences. It's not the only evidence, but it is one of the evidences that you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you don't speak in tongues, you... 